Testing, testing. Excellent. Can everybody hear me? So it just goes to the... Okay. All right, well, I'll probably annoy the mic person a little bit by screaming from time to time. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Clinton Roy. I'm from the CSIRO, which is an Australian federally funded research group. I'm from Queensland. Um, I work in a division of CSIRO, which is the ICT division. And within that division, I work in a little lab, which is the Autonomous Systems Lab. Uh, this is a slightly old picture of the members of our labs, plus some students, um, plus some of the vehicles that we've got. Um, we have a lot more full-timers now, um, and right at this point in time, we have about 30 summer students who are with us, so probably about twice as many of, of people as there. Um, so spring. Spring is a collection, many people would call it a grab bag or a potluck bag of software. Um, it's been developed over about 10 years inside of CSIRO. Um, there's all sorts of different bits of software that are in it. Um, it essentially does all of the low level stuff that we want to do when we're doing robotics work. Um, it takes events from sensors, um, it gives uh, control events to things like motors and actuators, it handles passing events around the machine, um, it's, and it, it has some stuff in there for actually controlling the machine and making it behave intelligently. Um, the phrase I currently am liking to use to describe the quality of it is that it is organically designed. Um, I like using oxymorons like that. Um, I was essentially hired to maintain Spring, to open source Spring, and to re-engineer Spring a little bit and clean it up. Um, and a lot of that effort is basically going through the source code and replacing a lot of homegrown solutions with a lot of standardized solutions. Um, so the licensing, it is under the lesser GPL license. Um, the reason we went with this um, is that we want to be able to do commercial work ourselves with it. So we want to base our robots and have the low level stuff done in spring and then some of the high level control stuff done in proprietary commercial code and still have it link against the spring libraries and not have any legal issues. Um, we do not yet have a contributors agreement, which is something that I'm training the lawyers up on slowly. Um, this slide basically gives you an overview of um, the different classes of robots that we work on. Um, we do a lot more robots than this, but this, this gives you a good sort of um, overview. Um, two things from this slide. We do robots in the air, um, on the ground, under the ground, and in the oceans. Um, we do big robots, like the scales will go into in the future. We do really big robots, robots that are much bigger than that, and we also do really tiny ones like the Quokka. Um, and the other thing is that we do a lot of robots where it's essentially off-the-shelf trucks, and we add um, bits and pieces on top of them. And we also do a lot of things where we've designed them um, almost entirely in-house and built them from scratch. So I'm just going to go through the different um, projects now to give you a sort of sense for what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, this is the helicopter, and that's just to give some idea of scale. It's about the height of a human. I wanted to put it laying down, but it just started looking dodgy, especially the morning after the dinner. Um, so the, the, the overall goal that these guys have, the, the helicopter guys, is to be able to go and inspect um, high voltage, uh, long haul electricity lines. Um, at the moment, every 18 months or so, um, you get a helicopter, a couple of guys in it with high resolution uh, 
high resolution cameras. They fly up to these towers as close as they can get and go up and down the towers looking for faults and rust and things falling off and bolts without nuts, etc. Um, I, I would imagine that this is a dangerous and high stress job. And essentially what these guys are trying to do is replace that human driven vehicle with um, an auto autonomous one. So, I mean, the ultimate idea is to be able to just um, point at a tower and have this thing go and take images up and down. And you can have all the humans down at the base, um, out of the way in case it suddenly drops. Um, and they can do the same work in a much safer way. Uh, so this is the hot metal carrier. Um, I love the hot metal carrier because the environments that it works in is, are so ridiculously dangerous. Um, they're dangerous for humans because the aluminium is ridiculously hot. Um, you do not want that splashing on you. It'll be the last thing you know. Um, the environment is very hot. Um, the truck gets roasting hot. Um, there's little bits of aluminium shavings that fly around in the air, which are great for computers, as you can imagine. Um, there's high magnetic fields um, that go along with aluminium smelters because they use a lot of el electricity to process the bauxite that makes the aluminium. Um, so strong magnetic fields work really well with um, electronics. Um, it's a very noisy environment. Um, when I go on site, the, the most bizarre thing that I see is that um, there are pedestrian crossings for workers to cross roads where the trucks go, but um, it's made very clear that the trucks do not give way to pedestrians. It's very much the other way around. Like, if they saw you, they wouldn't be able to stop anyway. And this is a little crocker, so this just gives an idea that you can actually just pick it up and carry it around. Um, the unique thing with this that's quite different from a lot of our other robots is that it's designed to be pluggable. So each one of those squares um, can be taken out and there's a, a standard um, connector that you can make a little module that does something like it can have a, it can have a camera or a claw um, or an extra battery or any sort, of, um, any sort of thing that you can think of pretty much. You can put it onto one of the standard boxes and plug it into the quokka and you only have to worry about making your little box work. You don't have to worry about making the rest of the quokka work unless somebody else has broken it. Uh, so this is the Bobcat. Um, this one's a nice image because it shows off some of the stuff that we've added to it. Um, so you can see the, the yellow and the purple laser um, unit that's mounted on the top. We've added that. And this rear box here has been shunted on the back of the Bobcat and inside that we put all of our computers and power supplies and network switches and all that sort of jazz. Um, this one is Starbug. Um, it's a submarine. Um, it's a neutrally buoyant submarine. So the idea is that um, it actually um, has thrusters at each one of these holes and it pushes itself down and then it basically flies down into the water instead of uh, taking on ballast and sinking. Um, the original plan for Starbug was to be able to fly around the Great Barrier Reef, spot um, Crown of Thorn starfish and inject some poison into it. Um, I've seen some images where it's picked out some Crown of Thorn starfish. Um, I'm not quite sure why it didn't go to, to the end. Maybe it was picking out scuba divers. I don't know. Um, so on all of our machines, we, we use the, the spring suite of software. Um, Yes, yes, please. Questions at any time. Right, so, sorry. Um, so, so the idea with, no, it's not a killer death robot <laughs> yet. Um, the, the laser is an input device that can scan in front of the machine and figure out what's directly in front of it. Um, and the, the overall idea of the Bobcat is to be able to eventually um, give it a map or give it some simple directions and have it go and build a, dig a trench or build up um, a pile of dirt somewhere. Um, Bobcats are fairly dangerous things, like they're very useful devices, but they're fairly dangerous things as well. 
Um, so almost all of the work that we do is based around either just improving uh, the safety of something, like we're getting humans out of harm's way, or getting them to do things that's just difficult for humans to do. Um, so on all of our um, on all of our machines, you've got the same basic architecture. Um, we've got some software that's called DDX, and this is the event distribution model. It stands for Dynamic Data Exchange. Um, you don't really need to understand why it's dynamic and why it's data exchange. But basically, you get events from your input devices. So my colourful camera here and the laser devices, they basically take, um, take measurements from the world, turn them into events, and then they publish those to the DDX cloud. Um, the brain, which symbolises the um, control of the machine, um, gets told of these input events, so every time there's a new image or every time there's a new scan on the laser, um, it gets told of those and it can figure out what it should be doing, like if there's uh, a building in the way, it should probably stop and not hit it. Um, yes and yes, and that I'll go feature into that. Um, well, the correct answer is it is now. Um, so the the control is the essentially the control bit is the bit that is not in Spring. We have some control stuff in Spring, but a lot of that is project specific. Um, so the brain figures out what it wants to do from the inputs, um, publishes those events to DDX, and DDX makes sure they get to the right um, output handlers. Um, and in this case, we have an, um, a servo motor, and those things are typically used to um, turn steering wheels and stuff like that. And then your actual motor to actually make vehicles go forwards. Um, and you've also got other things to um, raise and lower the forklift booms and stuff like that. Um, so I mentioned before we don't really have that many vehicles. Um, we have a lot of big scary vehicles and we don't really want people to be operating them all the time. So a very common thing that we do is one of the tools that comes with DDX um, is DDX log. So somebody takes the machine out, um, hooks all the sensors up, takes the machine out for a drive, um, it disconnects the brain from it, um, so takes all of the input events and puts it into a log file and this is commonly just o over the network or on a USB stick. Um, so you've got a log of all of the events that um, you've seen. And you can do a lot of things like um, driving up to a wall so that you get laser or, or image data um, that if the machine was driving itself would potentially or hopefully stop at. Um, and you can log all, all of those events to a file. Then the researcher can take that file back to his desk and he can use the other half of the toolkit, which is DDX Replay. He can take that log file and replay it into his own DDX cloud that's sitting on his computer. And he can run the control software on his desktop and he can fine tune his algorithms. So for example, if he screws up the algorithm to stop when the wall's coming, it doesn't matter because he's not in the vehicle, he's just at his desktop. And the whole idea here is that you've basically got a stream of events from your input devices and they've been, uh, because we're using the DDX cloud as the way of communicating between everything, we're able to disconnect the inputs and the outputs. And we're able to basically put the robot inside a simulation environment so that you can test and retest your algorithms without having to go out and drive the robots around every day. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, something that's um, something that's not entirely obvious is that a lot of these things um, here. I'm, I'm basically just showing that you know, the lasers and the cameras are all input, and the motors and the servos are all output. Um, 
it's generally not the case. Generally, the, the motors and the servos will give you feedback on, um, so you apply a certain amount of voltage to them, they move a couple of um, units, and they will respond to that. So the, most devices are not just publishers of events or um, consumers of events, most do both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but... Um, a simulator is very useful, and we do have a simulator as well. But nothing beats getting real data off the truck. So, basically the next slide is opening up that DDX cloud and having a look at, at that internals of that more deeply. So on any given vehicle, it's very common to have um, two or three or four computers um, that are all networked together. Um, you generally find that the processing of image and laser data is quite intensive and will take up most of a CPU. Um, and you will also find that a lot of sensors and stuff like to have um, a little bit of uh, a computer just to control them. So. In this example here, we've got a large-ish um, x86 box. We've got a, a small x86 box and a small ARM box. And they're all connected um, to the DDX cloud. The DDX cloud has two components to it. It has the catalog and it has the store. The catalog is responsible for basically recording and knowing the types of data. The stores are responsible for having the values of the data. Um, and this example here, we've got, um, so we've got some little machine that's just controlling the GPS unit. We've got a machine that's, we've, on the, the big server, we've got the laser and we've got the controller. And then we've got some other machine that's just doing the hydraulic control. Uh, the solid lines are just TCP connections. Um, and the dotted line is a multicast connection. Um, I've got a walkthrough coming up that should make some of that a little bit clearer. But so, so the, the important point here is that inside the DDX cloud, um, there can be any number of computers. So if you need another computer to do some more processing, you can plug that into the cloud and you don't have to change any of your other software. Um, and you can use the computer that is fit for purpose. So um, you can have... Um, a big grunty uh, GPU uh, computer to do graphics processing and then you can have a tiny little low powered arm that board that can sit off onto one of the arms and do things. And all of the, the cloud takes care of transferring the data types so that if you've got machines of different, different endinesses or different architectures, different alignments and stuff like that, it all gets handled for you or it does now that I've fixed up the code. <laughs> mm. There was a lot of code down there that looked like it was doing the right thing. And then I saw that um, the, the bit to swap the endiness of something was hard-coded to one. Fixed now. So what I'm going to do now is we've got a slightly simplified example um, of a DDX cloud. We've got um, just two computers here. Um, doesn't really matter um, what computer the catalog or the stores are on. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to show how the GPS unit and how the machine, uh, how the controller talk to each other across the cloud. And we're basically going to have a, um, a very high overview of the packets that go across. So the GPS controller starts up and it wants to register a type with the cloud. So it sends off uh, a packet saying, are we good? Um, <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so the GPS controller sends off um, a register type command and it's uh, a GPS struct and just for the example here we're just going to pretend that that's three integers so an X and Y and a Z. It's not that in real life but it's much easier to fit that on a slide than anything else. All the store does is really pass that request on to the catalog. Uh, the catalog looks at the type, looks at the type name. Uh, it actually has a little C parser in there, so it knows what C structures look like. Um, and it goes, yep, I now know that there's a type called GPS T struct, which has three ints, an X and a Y and a Z. The next thing that the GPS controller does is says, I would like to register a variable of type GPS T, and I'm going to call it GPS. And the store does a similar thing, it just passes that on to the catalog. So now the catalog knows that there's a variable, it's called GPS, and it's of type GPS under T. And now the controller would like to announce that it's going to be publishing to that variable. So again, it just sends off a little message saying to the store saying that I'm, I'm announcing that I'm going to be publishing to that variable. So I'm going to be um, changing the value of that variable. And the store just tells the catalog that again. And the catalog notes that down. Now we have the controller that's waking up. And it wants to register a type called GPS struct T that's of the same type um, that the GPS controller has done. And its store just passes on to the catalog. The catalog notices that the, the type here is of the same name that's been registered before, so it makes sure that the types that these two are trying to register under the same name are exactly the same. Um, it makes sure that there's no conflict, basically. So we've now got to the point where both the um, producer and the consumer know um, that they're dealing with the same type for GPS data. Uh, the machine brain, so the, the controller um, now registers itself as a consumer of the variable GPS, so it wants to be told whenever that variable changes value, and it just part the store passes along to the catalog. Uh, so the catalog notes down that it's got a consumer of that variable now. So what it does now is that it notices that the catalog notices that this store is um, publishing the variable GPS and this store is consuming the variable GPS. And it notices that they're on two different stores. So it sends a message to store one saying that to commence sharing the variable GPS. So whenever this store gets an update of the GPS variable, it will send it on the multicast link and all of the other stores will receive that variable update. So the store basically just notes that down. So we finally got into a state where um, all of the types and all the variables have been registered and we can actually do updates now. Uh, so the uh, GPS, the actual GPS unit finally um, gets sync down in Australia. Um, and let's just pretend it's position one, two, three. The, control, the GPS controller sends that updated value to the store. So the local store for that controller knows that the value is now one, two, three. The store knows that it's meant to share the variable called GPS. So it sends it out on the multicast link. So all stores that are connected to that multicast link will get that update. So the remote store sees that updated value. And finally, the, um, the brain or the controller machine gets that update. Um, so the, the thing here is that um, the, controller, the, the catalog is in, in control of the cloud, essentially. So it's the one that makes sure all the types and variable names are all the same and all correct. Um, we don't worry about authentication. We make sure that they're closed networks. And we're a research group, so security is not a problem. Um, so, so the deal with 
So most of the stuff with the multicast stuff, um, there's, there's defense in depth for those sorts of issues. So um, if something really needs to be told something, um, so if the lasers really need to tell something somebody, we won't do it over a multicast link. We'll, um, so in, in the previous example, we'll have the lasers on the same machine, and those packets won't go over the multicast link. Um, and it's, it's going to be fairly easy, fairly shortly in the future, to force that over a TCP link as well. Yep. Yep. So the, the multicast update will go across to all of the stores. Yes. Um, but the stores can look at that variable name and the, the individual stores will know if they need to um, update their own clients. Oh, sorry, yes? So there, um, there are several ways of, of, of dealing with that. So generally the time of flight is small enough that it's not an issue. Um, there are several things that we do. So we put in fake packets that just have the timestamp that they were sent at, and you can do a round trip so that you can be both, so you can publish a timestamp and also be a consumer to it. So by the time it gets back to you, you can check out the time of flight and see if that's um, too long or too short. And you can raise an error at that point in time. Yes, yes. Um, so, so to this point, we've not, I've not done too much profiling stuff. Um, but that's not been a problem so far. Mm -hmm. But that is certainly something that I'm looking at. So um, essentially, so it depends on a lot of things. Um, but when you're wiring the machine up, you'll, you'll know um, what sensors you're going to be placing onto it. So a lot of that stuff, it's, it depends. So with GPS, for example, most vehicles will only have one GPS unit. So the, the common thing is just to have GPS. Um, there are some vehicles that will have uh, multiple laser units on them. And you'll just call it laser zero, one, two, three. Um, it depends how well, well written the programs are. So a lot of the programs will just look at hardwired variable names. A lot of the more mature programs, you'll be able to say on the command line, these are the laser variables, and you'll be able to do that at, at runtime, like a, essentially a configuration file for that. Um, and this is the thing where, um, so if a student comes in and writes something, and it's just over their summer break, all the variable names will be hardwired. And then if we want to turn that into something we can actually use on a production code, we'll have to do a lot of the engineering work to do all of that sort of stuff. So it's, it's easy enough that the students can sort of get to grips with it quickly enough, but it's flexible enough that we can turn it into production code at some point in time. Oh, yep, sorry. Um, not as part of the store stuff, no. So separately to this, we do... Um, so generally speaking, the computer that the catalog's running on will run an NTP server, and everything else will sync off that. Yep. Um, timing issues are um, have bitten us in the past, yes. Um, and I think how I want to do things is, is have um, a timing heartbeat sent out by the catalog that goes to all of the stores, and that way synchronize things. But that's a little bit further on. Um, so, my job is essentially, oh. Oh, yeah, very much so. It's generally NTP, so it's about a quarter to a half of a second. So 
Oh, no, no. Um, so one of the things that, that frightens me most about a lot of the code, um, and I was essentially hired to clean this stuff up, um, there's a lot of thread usage through it. So all of the programs spawn three or four threads to do one or two things. Um, and there's, there's definitely a meme at, at LinuxConf that threads are bad. Um, and I fully support this meme. Um, I'm very big on testing um, big 2,400-ton robots that can kill hundreds of people at once. I really want to have things tested. The things that thre th threading makes that virtually impossible. Even if you have tests that fully cover all of your code, all of the branches, if you then go and shove a couple of threads in there, you can never actually run all of the possible execution traces. Um, Threads, however, are not the real problem. Um, threads don't tend to proliferate. Um, you'll generally have a program and it'll have like a reader thread, a writer thread, uh, some sort of watchdog thread and some other control thread. Um, what does tend to proliferate though um, are locks on the data. Um, <sighs> nobody does threaded programming right. Ever. It's very hard to do. And there's so much code that I've seen that um, the threading, you know, it's some places lock things, other places don't lock things. And when ev people first started threading programming, they'll have a lock, they'll have a global lock, and then they'll just like the Linux kernel, they'll decide that that's not good enough and they'll try to go for more fine grained locks. So you'll end up having a lock on every bloody variable that you've got. Um, and it's very easy to not lock those at the appropriate times or forget to unlock them. Um, and threaded APIs have different priorities and different schedulers. And I really don't like the idea of um, having the behavior of one of my vehicles come down to some scheduler vagarity. I really want to be able to lock that down and say, if these input events come in, this is what's going to happen. And I can't do that with a threaded main loop. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I'm currently involved with at the lower layers um, is, is, is basically replacing a lot of threaded code with a basic uh, event-based uh, main loop. So basically the, a poll or a select main loop. Um, so you've got low-level events that, that come in off the network for, for things that come off the store. Um, but you also have higher-level event loops, uh, higher-level events as well. So the DDX client library, for example, it will have to ask the main loop to tell it when there's uh, new, new variables have arrived off the network stack and it's waiting for those to be picked up. But to read an updated variable um, off the network stack into memory might take three or four reads. So what libddx can then do is actually publish a high level event to the main loop. So from the application point of view, you're not dealing with the low level events, you're only dealing with one high level event. Um, I go into a lot of detail in the accompanying paper if you're interested in that stuff. Um, one of the things that um, I'm hoping to change very shortly is the file format that DDX log writes and DDX replay reads. Um, essentially, we're just logging C structures and replaying C structures back. Um, there's a file format that's come out of um, NASA called HDF5. It stands for Hierarchical Data, Data Format. It's a self-describing file format so that when you um, open it up, there's a whole bunch of metadata telling you what types that file actually stores. Um, 
and it's basically a, a perfect match for logging our store data because we can, at runtime, we can receive all sorts of different types that we didn't know at compile time, and HDF5 can handle all of that. Um, a current problem with our in-house file format um, is that all of the types um, that are associated with it, um, so if you want to log a certain number of variables, when you start the log file, you have to know in advance what variables you want to log. So if you then go and attach or turn on another sensor, you can't start logging that new sensor. Um, and that's um, a particular issue that will go away with HDF5. Um, HDF5 also has a lot of programs built on top of it. Um, it's becoming a reasonably standard file format. So there's a lot of graphical programs that can take um, our, our log files that will be written in HDF5, you can take those two things like MATLAB and Mathematica and Octave and read those uh, files straight in to do processing on those. Um, and at the moment there's a lot of exporting and importing and very painful stuff. There's a module on top of HDF5 called Fast Query, um, which does indexing of the data in a HDF5 file. Um, and that essentially enables you to do SQL-like queries on top of um, the unstructured data. Um, HDF5, it's used um, in the aeronautical in industries for um, logging data um, from sensors and stuff. So it's, it's, it's already used in very similar applications to what we're using it for. Um, there is currently a Python ABI to our library. Um, I really want to update that and clean it up. I would like to basically force everybody to use the Python API because there don't seem to be too many people who know how to program C or C++ at my job. That's generally not going to be an issue for us. Um, because, so, so the thing is that, the, the thing that I thought, sort of found hilarious is we have this lovely big event-based distribution network across the whole machine and then you have a look at individual programs and they're these horrible little threaded messes. So in the large we use events successfully and all I want to do is use events in the small. So if we go to a system where we're doing event-based stuff, um, I don't see the global lock as being a problem at all. Yep. Yes, yes. Um, and I mean the thing is that um, I, I, love, I, I love both C and I love Python equally as much. Um, and when you're doing low-level robotic stuff, you, you really have to be using C. But if, you, if you're a researcher and you're just starting out, you've only got three months with this, you don't want to be spending all of that time coming to me asking program, you know, why is my program seg faulting? Or I've got this memory corruption bug. So I want to completely get around that. As I've said before, I'm really, really big on testing. Um, as I'm going through the, the stack, I'm adding regression um, tests. Um, there's a lot of code there at the moment which is exercises, so it will test things if you sit there and press numbers by hand and do things like that. It's not a regression test, it's an exerciser and they're not that much use. I'm doing code coverage, so as part of the continuous integration build, every time somebody submits a change, we do a whole new build, we run all the tests, um, and we also have a code coverage report. Um, and that's been really useful for highlighting parts of the code that aren't being tested. Um, I really hope to do code reviews um, <laughs> in the future. We have to hire some more engineers. Sorry, Dave. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things that um, I've spent a little bit of time on is libinterpose, which is an internal library. Um, this enables you to test your error conditions. Um, there's a whole uh, presentation on this. I think it's fun with LD preload. I think that's tomorrow. Um, that's a very cool library, um, if I do say so myself. Um, the idea came from Rusty, so all the coolness goes to Rusty, of course. Um, but the, the thing is that that enables me to get 100% code coverage of everything, even the error conditions, and I can make sure that I handle the error conditions gracefully. Um, 
So, you know, if the robot's going along and it runs out of memory, you really want to make sure that that condition is handled properly. Um, and then there's the classic tools like electric fence for making sure that you're not doing any dodgy things with memory. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, a lot of the techniques that I'm sort of using, I've essentially learnt at or from um, LinuxConf. Um, use a real camera. Um, so it's kind of funny, but like um, Ted So, for example, is really big on doing proper regression test suites. He's the EXT234 author. Um, Martin Poole, um, who is currently working for Canonical on the BZR distributed um, CVS, um, version control system, sorry. Um, he sort of introduced me to GCC attributes which are little snippets of code that you can add to your C code um, that give the compiler hints about what you're going to do with that code. Um, and you can do useful things like, um, say, the error recode, the error return code from this function is really important. And if somebody calls this function but doesn't check the return code, flag a warning, and then if you can make, turn that into an, uh, an error. Um, and there's whole bunches of things like that that are really useful, but basically extensions to C. Um, and, sorry? Yes. Um, and Rusty for libinterpose, so this is one of the techniques that they use to test their net filter code, um, is, th is the inspiration behind my libinterpose library. Um, switch it to auto, Dave, you might have a bit more luck. Um, so essentially, um, when you come up to a function that could fail, you fork at that point in time, um, the parent succeeds and you go along the true path, the child fails and you go along the false path. Um, and you've basically got two processes at that point and you can make sure that the one where it fails, oh, sorry, and you can make sure that the one where it fails um, is handled gracefully. Um, I can talk forever about that topic. Um, later. Um, so that's essentially the talk. Uh, I'm on to the thanks now. Um, there have been a lot of authors of DDX um, and all of the Spring um, tools over the years. Um, the most recent is Cedric, who's now um, in Switzerland, heading up a robotics research group there. And the real push for open sourcing Spring came from him. Because he wanted to, he's been with us for seven years or something, and he wanted to continue using the toolkit over in Switzerland. Um, I'd like to thank Paul Flick and his student Eloise for helping me come up with some of the graphics for the toolkit. I'd like to thank Dave and Polly for putting up with the angry engineer. They've had to share a cubicle with me, and I'm not the easiest person to get along with. Um, and I'd like to thank the conference organisers, the venues, and all of the uh, volunteers as well. Um, and finally, I would like to thank Nancy Duart, who wrote a book called Slideology, which I read about three weeks ago and threw away all of my previous slides, which are all text heavy and all of the graphical ones are sort of inspired by that. And I would like to thank Till Tantor, who I know I'm not pronouncing correctly. He has written a LaTeX environment called TixZ and another one called PGF that allow you to do graphics without learning how to use the mouse. Uh, that's the slides, yes, yes. There's a show of appreciation from uh, Linux at all for Surveyor. Thank you very much. Um, so, thanks very much. <laughs> you don't get to do that, Dave. Um, questions? I'll repeat. So DDX is the event distribution mechanism of Spring. So Spring, um, so um, Spring is a whole suite of tools, um, and at the moment I'm working on the lower level ones, and, and DDX is a fairly low level one. Um, 
Yes, yes. No. So you can go to downloads.syro.au and get the open source tarball, but we don't yet have a proper open source site. That's Things move very slowly inside of Syro. Um, and we're, ver we're hoping to have a um, Jira installation set up very shortly. So internally, I've got uh, a little track environment set up and there's SVN and stuff like that. But Syro don't currently um, have anything like that available to the outside world, but it will happen. Um, so download Hubble and have a look at it. There is documentation in there. It's crap, but there is some there. <laughs> oh, um, and uh, there's a paper that accompanies this slide which will give a lot of details on what I'm currently doing on it as well. Um, I don't know, but it will be wherever you can get the slides. Or you can... Um, I, I will make sure it's available if you Google for my name. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, so the particular one is, is Robot Player, which I think comes from either MIT or CMU in the States. Um, they are a lot more advanced in some of the things that they do. Um, we're a lot more flexible in some of the things that they do. So one of the main things is that um, the networking between modules at the moment the marshalling technique for that is an in-house thing. I'm moving to XDR, which is the same that Robot Player uses, so that should be able to interoperate fairly easily. Can you get a Quokka? Can you get a Quokka? Um, there are about 15 grand. Yeah. All right. I think I should stop at that point, so thank you very much.